Hello everybody, um, Uncle Paul Calcott here and I'd like to welcome everybody to the First Nations Mental Health and the NDIS webinar. Uh, before we get started though, I'd like to do an acknowledgement. Um, so what I'd like people to do at this time now, um, in keeping with the way that we now uh, present and conduct business on multiple countries, is for people to take the time to reflect and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that they're now meeting on or living on. And, um, and just think about the people that walked and cared for that land for thousands of years and kept it, um, this country uh, the most unique and beautiful country that it is um, and to appreciate that. I actually, uh, if you don't know who they are, I suggest you do a bit of a Google search the, after this webinar and find out who the traditional owners are of where you live. I'm a Wiradjuri man from central New South Wales, but I now live on Kabi Kabi Jinnaburra country up on the beautiful Sunshine Coast. And um, I have the huge honour and responsibility of being a community elder up here as well around disability business. So I would like to pay my respects to the elders, any elders that may be uh, viewing this webinar, elders in my community, um, elders that are present here with me, and also to our ancestors who I feel watch over us all the time. And I hope that they look down and guide us today that our meeting is a productive meeting and we come out of it with a little bit more education, stronger relationships and feeling more comfortable to have a conversation with community. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that what this whole webinar is about is to support our community living with um, mental health issues. Mental health concerns and psychosocial disabilities is a, 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 a rather major concern in our community. It goes undiagnosed, unrecognised. A lot of people just deal with it in silence. Um, it's a byproduct of colonisation and many people from the stolen generation who are now living with intergenerational trauma. So I hope that today, um, if one or two people feel more comfortable to have that conversation about mental health in community and can support even one person to navigate their way through that and get the supports and help they need to help them keep them strong uh, will be a very productive outcome. So, and if you, you know, during this webinar, if subjects are talked about that you feel uncomfortable um, or it brings up issues, um, look, you know, don't feel obligated to stay on. Maybe take some time out and, and seek some support later on through the uh, reimagined um, people here. So um, thanks very much for that. And what I might do now, I'd like to acknowledge our speakers today. Um, I'll have the huge honour of having a bit of a yarn with you guys. Um, we have Artie June Reamer, who I'll introduce in a moment and she can give her own intro. And I also have with me Auntie Eve Kitchener, who is a Wiradjuri woman an amazing woman and a survivor. Um, <clears throat> Auntie Eve was part of Stolen Generation and she'll share some of her story today about art and her resilience and her strength and how she keeps strong in, um, in her connection. So are you all ready to go then? June, I'll hand it over to you and uh, you can have a, you can start off with a bit of a yarn about um, some of the challenges in our community. Thank you, Paul. So um, good afternoon everyone, um, thanks for joining us here on um, the many lands of the Aboriginal people across this nation and I too would like to pay respects to, the, to those elders both past and present and any Aboriginal people um, on this video web webinar today joining us and non-Aboriginal people and acknowledge that um, we all come together on this land but we tread lightly and pay our respects for those that have gone before us. So as Paul said, my name is June Rima. I'm a Dungadi Gumbunja woman from the north coast of New South Wales. So that's the Nambucca Heads region. Um, for those who may know, um, it's halfway up the coast on the way to Queensland and another state where we're not allowed in yet, but shortly we will be. So um, I work for First Peoples Disability Network Australia. So we're the national Peak and representative body um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people living with disability and their carers and, and their families. So um, I'm Deputy CEO there and um, we are all quite passionate um, at FPDN to ensure that change and development and ways of doing business are, are, are more appropriate for our mob and you know we hope for a better future. So. Um, webinars like today, um, you know, is supporting each other to walk along in this journey and understand, you know, what needs to be done to make a difference in our community. 
So for those that don't know, FPDN has actually been around for 20 years now this year and, um, you know, we still have a long way to go, but some really important work has been done in the past with our founding elders, Uncle Lester Bostock and Annie Gail Rankin. So, you know, I honour them always that um, they started this voice, they started this footstep to make a difference and um, Paul and I and Annie Eve and many others in, in our um, community are continuing those roles. So in regards to, um, you know, our First Nations people living with disability and, and as today's topic, those living with mental health, I think the question we, we need to ask each other, you know, is which camp do we want to be in? Do we want to be part of the solution? Do we want to be part of change? And, 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 and what does that mean? And how do we work, you know, and walk alongside those that, you know, may need an extra helping hand? It's not about doing for, it's about doing with. And, you know, for many of our mob, you know, the intergenerational trauma and, and other things that have happened in our life is still very real today, you know. And so it's about supporting those to, you know, still keep connected to to their families, to their mobs, to their country. And that, you know, is vitally important in regards to health and wellbeing, as, you know, we all know. But you know, for First Nations people that, um, you know, maybe walking daily with, you know, thinking differently in regards to, you know, how they manage their day due to mental health. How, how do we support these people to, you know, get the supports that they really need? And what does that mean in their life? You know, um, we need to move away from the colonial concept that, you know, everyone needs to keep a clean home because that makes you a good person. Supports in, men, in people's lives can mean many things. And as Uncle Paul and Annie Eve, um, you know, will show us later today, art and, and um, other social activities are so important to people's health and well-being, that connectedness to being with their mob, sharing stories and, and talking through, you know, issues that they may have. But in regards to the service system, you know, for many of our people, they've been locked out of, of the service system for a long, long time. And that's, you know, for, for many reasons. But, you know, how do we change that narrative now? You know, moving into 2021, we, we really hope that, you know, the next year will be a different year. So it's about us all coming together and supporting those that, you know, need that little bit of extra hand to, to get up and, and move around and get out and enjoy all the things we do. How do we support them to, you know, improve or get an education? How do we support them to access um, employment? And how do we, you know, support them to have appropriate housing? These are the questions that we need to ask because, you know, we at FPDM would say you will find no more marginalised, you know, Australian today than an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person living with disability. And, and that's not good enough anymore, you know. We need to make changes and those changes need to be with, you know, talking talking with our people, understanding what they really want. And when we say talking, we mean listening. Really listening, you know, not and hearing. So, you know, I'm sitting down in um, Sydney at, at our office here and the, the local clan just down the road is called Darwalk. And um, there's a word in their language called Nara, which means to listen and to hear. And I think that's what, you know, 2021 needs to represent in regards to us all supporting, you know, those that need, you know, improved or better supports in their life. Really listening and hearing and, and understanding, you know, what they need to, you know, have the things that they want in their life. And sometimes it can be quite simple. It, it's just a matter of, you know, someone calling them up once a week and having a cup of tea or, you know, supporting them to access, you know, bureaucratic doc documents that, you know, weren't designed most times for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So when, when you listen to someone and when you hear someone, what they really need, things change in their life. So I think that's, you know, the message that we want to put around today is that, you know, FPDN and, you know, other um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and services are here to support, to make a difference, because I think it's all our work, you know, and 
when you make a dis difference in one person's life, it makes a difference in a whole of community and a whole of um, family for that single person. So that's what we need to think about, you know, when, when we're supporting our community. And I'll leave it there and I'm happy to talk more later. Uncle Paul. Thanks, June. Thanks for that. Um, so has anybody got any questions at the moment or, or do you want to leave those till the end? I think we're going to probably leave them till the end. So what I might do now oh, is... Paul, Paul, it's back. Just letting you know that we haven't had any questions come through. But if anyone would like to ask um, the panel any questions, please feel free to submit questions using um, the, the button on your... Um, web. Um. Right, thanks. thanks Rebecca. <laughs> so what am I going to do now is introduce RDE, but before I do that I might just do a quick chat about why art, as only June mentioned, is so important in our community um, in regards to telling stories, that connection to culture. We, um, we don't have a written language. Our language wasn't a written language. We're a nation of storytellers and art was our written language using symbols, that go back thousands and thousands of years to pass down messages and stories and um, and dreaming stories, which are fables, and uh, you know with all the with message, uh, with messages of how one should conduct themselves and uh, consequences to actions. So our artwork is a huge part in our history, and uh, and we don't even have a word for disability in our language. Um, so that's the thing that June and I have often come across when we go into community, that sometimes we could take a 20 minute conversation to identify actually what disability is in community, which is, has a double edged sword because it's actually quite wonderful that traditionally disability and so forth was just seen as part of the uniqueness and diversity of community. But it also means that often people go unrecognised of needing supports and services because they just blend in and just part of community and community doesn't see them as being someone that may need um, government assistance or help in that as well. So art is very important to us in telling our stories and especially around the area of um, mental health. In, it helps people to connect to their culture, connect to their community because when you sit down and start to paint and share your story using symbols that have been passed down for thousands and thousands of years it just goes very much into your very much into your DNA because this is very much us. We don't sit down to paint bowls of fruits or lovely still lights. We actually use symbols to tell stories. We may paint fruits, that will be the symbol representing that particular fruit that has been used for 40 or 50,000 years. So artwork is incredibly important and in, in part of the healing process. So what I might do is introduce Aunty Eve Kitchener. Now, just a bit of a background on Aunty Eve. She, an amazing woman and dear friend of mine. Um, we actually grew up in the same settlement as kids and we don't remember each other, but remember all the same things were around us. And we had this sort of a parallel sort of life where I worked as a gardener in some of the institutions that Aunty Eve um, suffered atrocities and abuse. And, um, and then 50 odd years later, we come together to paint and start to tell our stories. So we took this parallel journey that somehow has merged in together at the end. Um, Nadi Yeeb is a person who um, has uh, lives with post-traumatic stress um, and mental health issues through the abuse that happened to her as part of Stolen Generation. And uh, Aunty Eve also gave evidence at the Royal Commission um, into abuse. And just recently, um, a man who abused Aunty Eve and a number of other young girls while they're in care in uh, Paramount Girls' Home after, is it 50 years, Aunty? He's finally gone to prison. He's 73, uh, but it took a long time. And um, so she's sort of had to battle that all her life as well. So it's an honour for her to be here today. And I think if you bring up her artwork, Aunty Eve will talk about her artwork and how her healing um, is all part of her um, connection to culture. It's that cultural model, not the medical model, uh, but the social and cultural model. And uh, so I'll hand it over to you, Aunty, and. Um, we can't see on the screen any painting um, here at this end. The, the, the um, images aren't moving at all. So I'm not sure what's happened there. So, uh, but I'm sure Arnie can just talk about her artwork and her healing, you know, maybe by memory. So I'll hand over to you, Arnie. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, my name's, uh, um, my name's uh, Arnie Eve. Kitchener. Um, I've lived up on the coast here for 
for a long, long time. And um, I've just realised that um, in the last 15 years, the painting um, and, and linking in with my community here, the community, the Gabby Gabby Dinnerborough community and being accepted into this community, um, that my healing journey began when I started painting. And um, I painted a picture not long ago for the United Nations and um, I was able to tell that story um, to all the people that were um, needed to needed to know about the story, and um, it helped me. That, that story, you know, helped me very much with part of my healing. Um, going into how how the story I painted the story, how it has helped me deal with my mental health. Um, because my mental health is a big issue, you know, that I try to uh, live with. And, um, using my painting skills, um, my skills and um, thinking about what I'm going to paint is the main thing that I think about. I think how it's going to help me and help others. Um, and then I start painting and um, I put the story together. Like Paul said before, we don't um, we don't record it, you know, we don't write write our stories, we tell them through our art. Um, yeah, I've um, had a lot go wrong in the last year, you know, with my health and everything. Um but I've only just started getting back into into my painting. And um, I did a picture a couple of weeks ago for a friend of mine, uh, another Aboriginal woman who asked me, came and asked me to paint her a picture um, because she had a baby and she wanted the midwife in the picture and she wanted herself and her new little baby in the picture and um, she was that pleased with the story that I painted. She wants me to do another one for her, her place because she gave it to the midwife, you know. And it's just by putting the story together and painting that story um, that will be recorded forever, you know, her, her little birth, her baby. Um, yeah, so all in all, you know, um, yeah, my mental health, you know, um, it's still here. It's never going to probably go because it's been years and years of um, not just in the homes I was in, you know, growing up and being stolen, but just years and years of abuse and... Um, bad things that have happened to me and uh, uh, I just try and make each day, you know, count now. Um, I, I just live each day as it goes, you know, I don't plan nothing. I just wake up and think, oh, well, this is another nice day. I'll have to try and make the best of it, you know, to try and get through today. I, I, I don't live the way I used to live and try and plan everything out, you know. Um, uh, Nani, if you're a member of our elder group, there's a group yeah. called Elder, which is Elders Living with Disabilities Australia. And Nani, if all the elders there have a lived experience around disability, mental health, stolen generation, um, or a carers. And Nani, if you talk too about becoming part of that group and yeah. the elders, is what can help you as well. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I, um, yeah, um, I, I joined up because I am a carer. I care for my son. Um, who's got an intellectual um, disability named um, Joy, um, and he's got a lot of problems, a lot of mental health. Um, I've never seen anybody with such bad mental health. I never thought I'd see my own child with such bad mental health. But yeah, he he lived with a mental health to the point where sometimes he'll stay his room to pick up his much before he comes out. That's so bad. Um, he hates, just hates being around people because he's seen the hurt and um, he's seen the degradation that I've had to carry all my life and he scared people virtually because of it. It's like it's gone on to him and affected him. My life affected him and my daughter as well um, to the point that um, it's like an intergenerational trauma that they carried into their generation, which is really sad, you know. Um, they both are 
well. I must admit, you know, sometimes they pull away from the art. I don't know why, but I think it's because of the difficult times they go through with it, with their, with their, you know, what they've got to deal with. Um, my kids have seen a lot, you know. We've seen, we've seen things that um, probably some people would never see in their lifetime, you know. Um, they've seen, they've seen their own mother, you know, like garden and. Um, Bad to the core, virtually. Um, like I, 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 um, I've revealed some of the scarring and the, the horrible stuff on my body that I even carry um, from what happened to me. Of course, me, you know, years of um, it was going to put me years and years and years and years of um, trauma and mental health. Um, when I was in Parramatta Girls' Home, I had boiling water thrown on me in the dungeon. And, of course, where he threw it was somewhere where you'd always see it and it affected my, my body and my face. So virtually I had to walk through life covering my face with makeup because of it, because it's so bad. But my kids have seen it. And I think inside... It just traumatised both of them very, very badly and I think that's what started the intergenerational trauma in my children. They've seen, maybe not when they were little, but as they got older, they've seen... Um, I've seen them cry, actually, both of them. Um, I've seen also my son, you know, go, go downhill to the point where he... he was going to eat himself to death. He told me one day, I don't care. He goes, I don't want to be here. I'll eat myself to death. And of course, he was 130 kilos. And um, in the last three months, it's only been three months, he's taken himself to the limit where he told me, I need to pick my, my game up. I need to get myself together. Um, I don't want to die. I want to show you before you die, Mum, that I can have a baby. I could meet a nice lady and, and have a fa plan a family and you'll have grandchildren from me before you die. And this is what he said. And in the last three months, he's gone from 100 and, almost 130 kilos, I'd say 126, I believe, down to today. He came out and told me he was 108 kilos. I've seen him every day for the last three months drag himself out of bed at 5 a.m. in the morning and walk and run and climb stairs for two hours straight without stopping and then coming home and then living on virtually a shoe spring diet. So I've seen what he wants to do to make me happy and I've seen the stars. It, so I'm really, really proud. And also my daughter Susie, who's another, another girl that... Um, it's battled years and years with generational trauma and the same scenario for her that she's trying to do a weight loss journey and get herself together and um, get her life in order, you know. Uh, virtually, you know, I've told you, I've opened my soul to you virtually because I don't normally tell people about that, but in this case I thought it was all for somebody else. I hope it does. Honey, has been amazing sharing her story, and she um, she has helped a lot of people, and as part of the elder group, and I've seen her sit down, and people have been able to come to her and talk to her about their journey. And um, and as Honey said, like I think the point is, she doesn't it doesn't go away, but what she does, she learns how to do it. You said you know where you stand with it, don't you? Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that's a really important. Um, part of healing, but Artie's, um, you know, is involved in the elder group. She gives her time so readily for anyone that can help and share her story um, in the hope that someone else that may resonate with somebody else. Her artwork is around that. And she's also very generous because she donates her artwork to different organisations as well. And, um, and Susie, her daughter, um, I've got to say, um, is an amazing young woman. She, um, we've seen her go from someone who was institutionalised and dealing with a lot of issues to now studying at university, she's studying psychology, isn't she? Yeah. 
because she feels her lived experience can help other people. She has strong empathy for what other people are going through, but she also represented um, First Nations women with disabilities at the United Nations in New York a few years ago with FPDN. So I think it's a, it's a connection with community, isn't it? And that connection. and Yeah, yeah. And, and Arnie Eve is part of an amazing group of aunties here that get together. I think that's the thing that a lot of services don't realise. It's not always about coming in and doing housework or whatever and shopping. <laughs> it's about providing a safe space to get together and have a yarn with your kids and share stories and and um, support other people that are going through the same as you do. But, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So... So, so, you know, and Arnie's been in a number of exhibitions too. She was in the um, Unfinished Business one, beautiful pose where she shared her story there as well. So, uh, and she's appeared in a few of our videos, our resources. She's very helpful when we develop um, our resources and that as well. So um, her experiences um, mean a lot to a lot of other people. It gives them hope and it gives them a chance to think, here's someone who's been through the mill and is still sitting at the other side of, other side of this table talking to me and can tell the story. She survived everyone. In spite of what people tried to do, she survived it. And I think that's a huge thing. I didn't think I'd survive this year when I had a triple bypass. Yeah. So I'm not sure if the artwork was shown during that because uh, I'm not seeing it. But if you go on to the First People's Disability Network website, you can see um, RDE telling the story of her beautiful artwork um, that was actually exhibited at the United Nations in Geneva last year. And um, so, and, there's, and other artists as well in front of their artwork telling the story of their artwork, um, which is absolutely beautiful to hear you know, the artist tell their story firsthand. And uh, it takes on, the artwork takes on a whole new meaning. It does. Yeah. Uh, actually, when you hear the story. Yeah. It's when sorry, you hear the story. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt, guys. It's fair. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, Paul. Um, one, uh, Melissa has asked, um, where is a good place to access NDIS-funded resources for First Nations people? A lot of people under NDIS are seeking Aboriginal funded art groups or support workers, but we don't know where to start looking. Um, do you have any advice on where they can go to look for um, those types of um, services? Um, at the moment, I don't think there are any around. We've actually applied a number of times through the ILC grant to, um, to start art groups um, around disabilities and healing. And uh, we often we get feedback that it was a great idea, but we still haven't managed to get funding. The art group here, um, we run on the smell of an oil rag. We operate out of my garage, my studio. SPDN support me in my role to facilitate it, and the artists sell their artwork and contribute back into the group to buy more resources. So at this point, um, I couldn't direct anyone to a particular art group that's run by our mob. There are some that are run by, um, unfortunately, by non-Indigenous organisations with the best meaning intentions, but unless it's run by mob and the storytelling, it sort of loses a lot of its impact in that respect. So, um, But we are slowly, um, at PDN, we're trying to put it together and we're trying to um, start some, um, you know, some funding again to see if we can start this one, formalise it, and, um, and also you know, um, support the one in Tennant Creek. But at the moment... I couldn't direct anyone to one where um, the artwork is done as a proper healing way, where it's run by the elders, where the elders come in and sit down and support other people in telling their story and um, and the connection through the art, and you know the paint proper way as well, where people, because you know when you sit down with someone from our community who has a disability, you're not seeing just a person with a disability or a mental um, health concern. You're seeing a person who could be an elder. They could be connected to elders. They could be a strong person in women's business. They could conduct men's business. They could be connected to saltwater dreaming, freshwater dreaming, desert dreaming. 
they're a very complex person and that's why when we say to start um, art groups and storytelling and healing, it, uh, there's a certain amount of skill in connecting people to be able to paint their own stories and their song lines. It's respectful for them in their, um, in their community. So we are getting there and we are putting it out there and it is slowly getting more recognised. I think the funny thing is that, you know, our little art group here, the First People Sicily Network, Nuna Ron Art Group, has represented our mob um, and our culture around disabilities on the world stage in both the United Nations in New York and Geneva and in Parliament House here, um, yet we still can't manage to get some funding mm -hmm. to support the group um, and um, keep it going. Paul, I'm happy to jump in there because the question yeah. was a bit further than that too. So... Um, that question was actually New South Wales too. So the, there are quite a few services across New South Wales. So um, I live on the coast and there's a culturally appropriate service up there. I'm, I'm not allowed to name them, but I mean, you can look them up. Um, on the south coast, Western um, New South Wales. So there are services around. Um, one portal that you can go and look on is building the local care workforce. Um, that they they have a, a demand map and other um, maps on their website that show where the service sector is. But um, getting back to that particular question, so it started off asking NDIS funded resources. Well, FPDN have developed culturally appropriate resource called Planning Our Way, which uses um, about um, uses stickers for people to understand rather than using language about what supports in their life they need to keep them strong. So that's the first stepping stone um, that in regards to culturally appropriate resources and Uncle Paul developed that. But also the NDIS program is about choice and control. And I think we need to move away from the fact that in everyone's life that all their services, all their supports need to be under NDIS or an NDIS funded support service. So if you look at the core supports in anyone's NDIS package, they can be purchased outside of NDIS funded um, service providers. And, and if you can't find a um, provider in that space, the other space to look at is the ILC program, Information Linkages and capacity building. So in that space, there's a lot of services that were um, funded to do, you know, activity supports. And there are Aboriginal groups that have done what, you know, been enabled um, through those submissions to um, get funding to do um, further support. So an example would be, um, is a fellow on the Central Coast that does disabled surfing. So, I mean, it's just about, um, I think, asking around and, and looking a little bit further afield outside the box, I guess I would say. And I do have a concern in that particular question too when it says it's sometimes easier to find Aboriginal liaisons within the health to navigate that system. We at FPDM would not advocate that. Health is um, works on the medical model of disability where we um, champion the social model of disability, which sits out that, um, that, that criteria. So the health model, sorry, the lights keep going in now. Um, the health model is about doing for rather than doing with, where the social model, model of disability is more about enablement and allowing people to you know, live the life they want to live, not what the service sector said they can support them with. So I think, you know, in regards to that question, I think you need to sort of go a little bit out of the box because there are services out there. There's not a great deal, but they are out there in regards to running um, culturally appropriate services, but also um, employing Aboriginal people to um, do that work. Yeah, very true, June. I'm afraid I just jumped straight into the art thing, which is my, my barra I always push um, in regards to art groups, but there are some good services around, even here on the Sunshine Coast, there's a number of individual people who have started culturally appropriate supports and services in community. So they are out there, um, you just need to have a look and they're sort of um, starting to operate as well under you know, people using their, as June said, their core supports uh, to be able to access 
um, these programs because it is about choice and control. And um, so and through to um, the medical model, um, the services, the, the IMSs, where some things they're, they're great and they do uh, need it, but they have no real knowledge or connection in regard to the social model of support and connecting people in the community and resilience-based models of support that help people, like, you know, um, develop their own networks and support groups and that as well. So it is a case of having a bit of research to see who is out there. Um, there is, I'm looking at the question, so someone's typed up where or how should we, should people have a look? Well, it's about going on sites, that's what FPDN do, that's what we do, that's how we find out information, or connecting locally. So, you know, there's many box in the traditional form of, you know, what a service looks like. So um, I think, you know, it's a bit of keyboard worrying and, and searching. So, for example, I would say ideas. Everyone should know about that if you work in the sector. So they're an information and referral service. It's free. They have a search engine that has about, if it doesn't it have somebody on their search engine, they basically don't exist. So that's one stepping stone. And I'm surprised people don't know about that. So, And the other part is, you know, do a bit of keyboard worrying. So if you go on the FPDM website, we have a map there where all the um, national advocacy services sit. They so all you have to do is type in the postcode for the area you're looking. And if you speak for the speak to the advocates, they can tell you what's a, what's around locally because normally they're connecting people outside the NDIS system. So you know a remote area like Moree, you know there's an amazing um, advocacy service that works up there, works truly with you know their population, mostly those living with mental health. So. You know, it's about talking and having a yarn to other people and seeing how they're doing business. And don't be afraid to pick up the phone and, and ask you questions. We're not going to eat you. Yeah, and it's about building relationships. That's true, as we said at the beginning, um, to do a bit of a Google search to find out who the traditional owners are of your area and um, some of the stories. But there's usually local first people's network groups in most communities. Um, where disability supports and different community-based services go to. So it's always worthwhile to um, go along to one of those and introduce yourself and find out who's doing what in communities. So the big thing is we can always recommend is to, um, yeah, to build those relationships, do a bit of a search to find out who's who and go and introduce yourself and start having a conversation because not everyone's going to come and knock on your door and introduce themselves. So, for example, as I said, I live on the North Coast. I'm on a, I'm a lo local Facebook page that has all the information, whether you, you know, weaving workshops or, you know, saving the koala, so, or, you know, and these are all therapeutic activities. So when I talk about, you know, looking outside the box and supporting a person to, you know, have the best life that they want, there's many activities in community or picking up your local paper and, and supporting the person that you're supporting, maybe volunteering. Community radio, you know, there's, there's the things that per, a person's life doesn't have to be packed in to an NDIS package. And I think we need to remember that. NDIS is to support them to get other things in their life. But we also need to look outside that NDIS package or encourage people that might be doing you know, really good programs to become an NDIS provider. You, it might be your work to support them to, um, you know, move into that space and, and the viability that, you know, there's so many um, participants in this area that would like to use your service. But, you know, we would like you to be an EIS provider. So I think it's about us all. As I said earlier when I opened my conversation, you know, I said, which side of the fence do we want to sit in? Do we want to be enablers or do we want to make change? And I think, you know, it's about, you know, um, moving forward and, and changing the way you do business. And when you change the way you do business, participants and people in the community will benefit. And I, I think that's the key thing that we want to do. And, you know, 2021, let's all change the way we do business. Think outside, you know, the traditional forms or the, you know, the cultural overlay forms, or the, you know, um, 
colonial forms of, of doing business. Let's look at that individual and see what they really need in their life. And, and that goes back to that listening and hearing. That's, yeah, that's very true, June, and it is about changing the way you do business and um, looking at the different model. I suppose that question about resources is a good segue into the fact that um, Reimagine has actually developed some great resources online. Uh, there's some fantastic videos there of people telling their story about the NDIS and supports and different models of services. They've been developed in multiple languages, so there's a resource there you can go into. There's some um, good printouts there that you as a service provider could use to start the conversation with community. I wouldn't recommend just printing stuff out and leaving it with someone. You need to sit down and have a yarn with someone and maybe use these resources to help you start the conversation because um, they're very they're culturally appropriate in the way that some of the symbols that they use. But the videos, I think, are amazing with people telling their story and it'd be a great way to show other people other people's journey and maybe give them some confidence to start that journey as well. So there's some really good resources in there. Um, also, if you go on to First People Sicily Network, June mentioned we have the Our Way Planning resource. Um, I, the, the reimagined ones have been developed in um, partnership with people from the Northern Territory and Cherbourg, which is up the road from us. Cherbourg has 49 language groups living in one community. So, uh, so they've done their, their homework in developing these resources. The same as um, FPDN, our, our Way Planning resource. The rationale behind how we developed that was that we spoke to multiple language groups throughout the Northern Territory, far north Queensland, Palm Island, Torres Strait down into New South Wales. And we actually um, got rid of pretty much all the text out of our resources, um, as June said, and we developed it so that people can... We use traditional symbols and storytelling for people to, uh, to identify different models of support they need in different models of their life because we decided that most of the people using this resource will be people with cognitive impairment or people where English was their third and fourth language. So we thought it'd be counterproductive to have something full of text, English text, um, to engage with our community. So we've used that, that's online as well, um, and it's been animated as well. So the resource, you can sit down and show it to someone and it takes them through via animation um, to how to use the resource. And it's basically just looks at different areas of people's lives. We've got rid of the whole um, um, resilience-based model of care, which is good, but we use the terminology of keeping strong. And we also don't come from a deficit-based area. We talk about people who are already strong and what you need to keep you stronger and keep you strong as well um, in different parts of your life. We've broken it down to things like relationships, or personal relationships, family relationships, your relationship to your community, and cultural stuff, your saltwater dreaming, fresh water dreaming, your connection to elders and to your ancestors online. And then people can put stickers in um, or write in it so that when they sit down with a planner or the end or even a service provider, they have a good idea about what support they're looking for in their life. An example might be we may have the community-based symbol and a person may put the sticker of a car and the sticker of a yarn circle. And that would be a prop to them that when they sit down with a planner or a service provider to identify that they need transport support to get to community activities or to men's business or women's business. So, and we also, um, again, we, we didn't use the stereotypical images of people because we didn't want to reinforce that image of what an, uh, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait person looks like because we come in many different shades these days. And, um, so, and we sort of get tired of asking how Aboriginal are you, are you half cut, quarter cut? They're incredibly insulting terms because that's the same methodology that the um, government used to actually take away children from community. And when you got to 116, you were no longer classified as Aboriginal. So we don't use any of those images. We use traditional um, symbols to represent storytelling. And we even developed a symbol for disability because there's no word that as well. So there's some great resources on. Um, go and have a look at the Reimagine um, website. And um, the videos and the stories there are amazing. So if there's no other questions, look, I, I recommend people go to the website and have a look. They can go to FPDN. I know we're sort of running out of time. But look, this was a great webinar. It's a great way to start the conversation around mental illness in our community. We still have a long way to go. It's a lot to cover in an hour, um, which is pretty hard to do. 
But I'd like to, you know, commend Reimagine for what they've done uh, for the ILC grant that's allowed them to provide some more resources. Uh, the more resources we have, the better. Uh, the more choice people have, they can go in and have a look and say, yes, this will help me. This will help me engage with people and um, start that journey. So um, good on everyone, um, Rebecca and the team, for what you've done. And you know, we believe in the NDIA. We think it's an amazing program. We think it has massive opportunity for our community. We just need people to be able to engage with it, uh, for people, to, as June said, to think outside the square and to utilise it to provide culturally respectful models for our community that will help them to get strong again and engage. And the, the possibilities are endless. We just need to be able to look at it and uh, move away from that sort of, you know, Anglo-Australian model of support where it's about service provision, domestic assistance, um, personal care, and look at ways that people connect into community and culture. And as you said too, you know, we don't need fixing. We don't need help. We don't need everyone to do stuff for us. We have as much to offer. We just want people to walk with us and to learn from us and to give us the same opportunities as everyone else to, uh, to connect the community, take our rightful place and be strong in our own community. So anything you'd like to add, Arnie, in passing? No, I just think what you just said is very true. Uh, so, um, so look, in saying that, please, you know, look at the resources, keep in touch, um, and hopefully, you know, we'll have more of these. Um, FPDM provides uh, resources around the Indigenous Disability Perspective, which might be very helpful to people. So um, if you want me to, Rebecca, I'm happy to close off. And also, people, don't forget self-care. You know, look after yourself. Um, if there's been conversations here or have opened up things that you feel... Um, you have opened up stories for you or you, you feel you need to have a yarn, reach out, talk to somebody and also, you know, service providers, you will go into community, you will support people and people may open up as unexpected and share their stories which, um, you know, will have an impact. We're all in this job because we have empathy and we care and that's what makes us uh, so different um, to the regular sort of workforce. So we do take on stuff as well. So, you know, develop your network Look after yourself, and um, as they say in the airplane, so put on your own oxygen mask before you start assisting everybody else. And uh, so, in saying that, you know, I'd like to thank everybody for the time to come in, um, and hopefully, we'll keep this conversation going, and uh, we'll all learn from each other and work together.